Welcome to another Tech Time Traveler video, and today I've got a question. Is this humble beige box the very last model of Commodore computer ever? To be sure, Commodore had very little to do with this Canadian market PC clone. They did not design it, they did not manufacture it, they didn't even support it. But Commodore Canada actually did authorize the use of their name and their iconic logo, which are affixed to the case and keyboard here like a cheap bumper sticker. And this machine was produced and sold before Commodore disappeared from the face of the earth. So perhaps there's a case here. To find out why this happened, we have to go back to 1993. Commodore International, one of the behemoths of the technology industry, was in deep trouble. Jack Trammell, the company's founder, had left in a huff nine years earlier and the company hadn't quite been the same since. That year, Commodore posted a whopping loss of over a third of a billion dollars. In nominal terms, that was almost a third more than the total of all of its profits going back to 1987. No company, no matter how large, could sustain those sorts of losses. It's really hard to believe that the progenitor of the world's best-selling home computer, the Commodore 64, could actually find itself in these straits. But Commodore, despite its huge size, ran on pretty thin profit margins. In 1984, the year it surpassed a billion dollars in sales, it barely eked out a profit margin of 11%. Contrast that with Apple, which in 1984 was pocketing two-thirds of the purchase price of a new Apple IIe in pure profit. By the early 90s, the company wasn't really innovating anymore. Its upper management knew lots about the bottom line, but didn't seem to know much about the technology industry, alienating dealers, employees, and software developers for their systems alike. By the middle of 1993, Commodore had laid off half of its engineers. One of those engineers, Brian Jackson, said that at the end, quote, you really didn't have a computer company. Commodore was a widgets company. They wanted anything that we could hack together real quick from existing technology and sell a zillion of them like we did with the Commodore 64. And that was part of the problem. The Commodore 64 had been kind of like a bolt of lightning, selling 12 million units over its lifetime. Topping that performance was always going to be difficult. The 128 sales were, by Commodore standards, lackluster. The Amiga was an amazing technological marvel in 1985, but it was expensive, proprietary, and by the early 90s, the formerly upstart PC was slowly eroding its advantages in hardware. The PC was a threat all around. It was gobbling up market share in both business and home markets with aplomb. Software developers were converging on the PC platform and increasingly leaving other proprietary platforms behind. The PC had set a global standard that other tech companies ignored at their peril. Not that Commodore was caught napping. Commodore did have its own line of PC compatibles designed and produced in-house. In fact, in 1984, Commodore had acquired a license to second source manufacture Intel's 8088 microprocessor. They had seen companies like Compaq ride the PC wave to great fortune with their portable PC clone, and they wanted in. In fact, they even had a portable of their own already lined up, what ended up becoming the Dynalogic Hyperion, also, I might add, a Canadian machine. The Commodore PC line was, by all accounts, reliable and a good value. The problem was, in the early 90s, the PC was rapidly becoming a commodity item, and Commodore held a relatively small share of the pie. As PC prices declined, Commodore was finding competing in the PC market to be less and less economic. Yeah, it seems kind of crazy that Commodore would be losing this badly. The aforementioned lackluster Commodore 128 actually outsold the Apple IIe by nearly a million units. The Commodore 64 outsold the entire Apple II line by a factor of two, and yet somehow they were still swimming in red. With the posting of such a gargantuan loss in 1993, the pressure was on to do something, anything, to save the company. Hence, this. In the early 90s, Commodore Canada was casting about for ways to support its parent company. For the home market, they'd be pushing the CD32, a shrunken Amiga 1200 that was designed purely as a gaming console. The company thought if it could sell about half a million of them worldwide, they could lift themselves back into profitability. That didn't seem like an impossibility given the millions of other Commodores they'd flogged previously, and a financial picture that generally seemed to be improving just a little bit. Given scarce resources, Commodore Canada made a decision to essentially abandon the home computer market and throw its resources behind promoting the CD32. It would continue to sell the Commodore PC compatible line to the more lucrative business market though. That was about all it could muster for the time being. However, seeding the home market didn't mean seeding any and all profit from it. Even though Commodore's market share in home PCs was marginal, the company's name still had lots of goodwill behind it, and for many consumers conjured up images of great value. So, rather than abandon the PC market entirely, Commodore decided to essentially rent out its name and trademarks to someone else. Enter 3D microcomputers of Markham, Ontario. 
Incorporated in 1989 as 3D Microcomputers Wholesale and Distribution, 3D Microcomputers was a successful and growing importer of Taiwanese PC clones. By 1993, it was one of the largest personal computer vendors in Canada. It isn't clear who approached who, but it seems they leapt at the opportunity to slap the Commodore brand on their machines in the hopes that it would attract attention from fans of the ailing company. It looked like a win-win. Commodore would earn some badly needed licensing revenue, and 3D microcomputers would be able to market its machines under Commodore's legendary banner. Consumers, however, well, what did they know? Looking at an ad like this one in the Vancouver Sun in December of 1993, it sure looked like there was nothing amiss here. There's the familiar Chicken Lips logo, and the name Commodore splashed all over the place. Nowhere does the name 3D microcomputers appear. The ad even seems to draw a direct line back to the classic Commodores of the past, with this blurb celebrating 15 years of quality and value in personal computers. If you bought one of these pseudo Commodores, you got a little leaflet like this with your warranty statement. Congratulations, the CBM personal computer system you've just purchased is covered by one of the most comprehensive three-year warranties available. Wow, three years. These days you're often lucky to just get one. I mean, this looks legit Commodore, right? There's the logo, there's the 1-800 number, and the usual banter about warranty conditions. Wow, they even offered on-site service. It's only when you get to the fine print at the bottom that you realize that something might be slightly off here. The warranty, it seems, is subject to a condition that you don't modify the PC substantially without informing... Wait, who is this 3D microcomputers? And what's this about Xerox on the back? Why am I calling Xerox to fix a Commodore? The warranty statement itself is pretty innocuous. It wasn't uncommon for manufacturers back in the day to demand prior notice before you modified your computer. Computers were not nearly as plug and play back then. But yeah, I wonder what a Commodore customer would have thought when they realized that Commodore didn't have anything to do with this thing. The 1-800 number on the leaflet here belongs to 3D. I wonder if anybody ever connected that between the different newspaper ads. And I wonder, did they actually answer as Commodore? Anyway, let's have a look at what you got from quote-unquote Commodore in early 1994. Okay, so what kind of, er, Commodore did you get for your 2000 bucks? Eh, apparently one with video card issues. Hmm. Okay, we'll get to that in a sec. So, officially, this is a Commodore model 4655MT. It's possible the T stands for tower, which is the nice form factor this machine comes in, complete with a proper keyboard key lock right on the front here. The keyboard is a no-namer, but actually it types pretty darn nicely. If we pop off the lid, we enter a dimension of total genericness. Interestingly, we can see CBM stickers, but none of the actual hardware was designed or produced by Commodore. This machine is purely a marriage of convenience. The motherboard is a good old PC chips workhorse with an Intel 46DX4100 CPU installed, minus any kind of heatsink. Wow. The board features 32-bit PCI slots and some 16-bit ISA and VLB slots. So we've got a good smattering of possibilities for upgrades here. In many ways, this is a lot like my first personal computer from decades ago, which started out as a 286 and then I upgraded to a 486. I'm pretty sure in my haste to keep things cheap, it probably featured a PC chips motherboard just like this one. I didn't know any better. The motherboard uses 72 pin SIMS for RAM and appears to have some empty sockets for what I'm guessing might be cache memory. I'm not sure. So what else have we got here? Well, we've got a Trident video card of some sort. Looks like a 9440 chipset. And that's obviously dead. We've also got a standard floppy drive controller. Ooh, and we've also got a modem. That's something I would have absolutely coveted as a teenager. And last but not least, we have this sound blastery looking clone sound card, complete with several hookups for proprietary CD-ROMs. Note that all of these components have these little warranty stickers that either say CBM or 3D, or in some cases, actually both. Were they planning to be essentially a unit of Commodore going forward? It sure looks like it. Going by the dates on the tags, it looks like this particular machine was actually built in very early 1995. So yeah, this one actually dates from after the collapse, probably as the licensing agreement was winding down and all the vultures were picking over the bones of the old company. And that could very well make it the very last Commodore computer ever. Now for storage, I can't say for sure what this machine originally had. I received it from a client after helping them upgrade to a newer machine. Part of the condition for getting it was that I had to destroy, and I mean destroy, the hard drive. And that drive may have been an upgrade anyway. Most likely, if we look at other CBM slash 3D offerings, it was probably something north of 500 megabytes. <laughs> I've forgotten about all those weird hard drive sizes like 245 megs and so on. 
Why couldn't they just round it up to 250? We've also got something that was very much in vogue in the mid-90s, the CD-ROM drive. The mid-90s were all about so-called multimedia PCs and all the useful things they could do for families like watch movies and stuff. Because hard drives tended to be so small, the CD-ROM's 650 megs of storage meant that you could do all kinds of things you couldn't have imagined before. In terms of performance, well, this benchmark is a bit off, but it does seem to do pretty well. Stunts here plays quite smoothly, although my driving clearly needs work. It fires up Windows 3.1 in a very timely manner, so you can whet your solitaire appetite, or type up a letter to someone that you're never going to print and send because it's early 1995, we don't have the internet yet, and you're too lazy to go to the mailbox. Yeah, all in all, it's a nice package. I don't know what the machine came preloaded with, but if we assume production was prior to 1995, it probably had DOS 6 or maybe Windows 3.1, just like we have here. Price-wise, I can't be sure, but I would guess this machine probably sold just north of $2,000, which was pretty average if memory serves. I think the average Joe would have been perfectly content with this gear, feeling all safe and sound in the false sense of security that the Commodore brand offered. Thankfully, this Studebaker of a computer was all general motherboard underneath, and the company wearing the Commodore disguise probably made sure you were well taken care of even after the whole deal went off the rails. Anyway, that's it. If you'd like a more detailed look at the machine, check out my companion talk and walk video, which will be coming out at the same time and provide a nice close up of this beast, along with some reminiscing from a guy who was there when this stuff was all new. So yeah, this machine is basically a rebadged generic beige box, a pretty sad bookend to the pioneering giant of the technology industry. In any event, the deal between Commodore and 3D microcomputers wasn't fated to last long. Commodore went bankrupt at the end of April in 1994, just four months after this agreement was signed. Along with the company went all of their intellectual property and trademarks, and thus probably every licensing deal they had made. There have been all kinds of reasons floated as to why Commodore died. Yet, some insist even now that Commodore, like Apple, could have carved out 5 or 6% of the market for itself with the Amiga and still been with us to this day. Sure, that's plausible, I guess. You know, if Commodore had paid off their Titanic-sized debt, if Gold and Medi had had an attack of conscience and committed corporate Harry Curie to spare Commodore's honor, if Tremel had come back and let his long-suppressed hippie instincts loose on a mission of corporate renewal, and, oh, if they'd invented a couple of multi-billion dollar category-defining products along the way, Commodore would be... Oh, who are we kidding? 3D microcomputers, on the other hand, has a happier ending. They went on for another 20 years after Commodore's collapse, more or less as they had before, flogging PC clones and rising to become one of the top five computer wholesalers in all of Canada. They appear to have closed their doors in 2017. So back to my question, is this a real Commodore computer? Well, some purists will say no, and I understand their point. After all, it wasn't designed by Commodore engineers, and it wasn't produced in an actual Commodore factory. That said, it is legally a Commodore computer. Commodore agreed to license its trademarks to 3D microcomputers. It allowed 3D to represent and market itself as Commodore or CBM personal computers. The computer was sold entirely while Commodore still existed, pre-bankruptcy. It was, whatever its merits, a Commodore-sanctioned product. As to the question of whether it is in fact the last or latest model of computer to be given the Commodore name before Commodore went bust, that's tricky, but I think this unassuming no-namer might have a good case. Some sources suggest the Amiga 4000T, the tower version of the Amiga 4000, was the final Commodore machine. It was released sometime in 1994, just before Commodore International collapsed. Other sources suggest it was perhaps one of Commodore's OEM'd PC clones, the 46 series, which seems to have stopped at 33 MHz before Commodore International exited the business. My particular machine, if I'm reading the warranty stickers correctly, seems to have been sold in very early 1995, post-bankruptcy, but given the 46DX4100 CPU is released in March 1994, it's possible this model existed well before then. Since the original deal that created it predates bankruptcy, I'm willing to stick out my neck and say yes, this is in fact the last official Commodore computer, with caveats. And yes, I know there were Pentium-class computers and others that bore the Commodore nameplate. But as far as I can tell, these were definitely post-bankruptcy creations, either by Tulip or Escom or whoever else got their hands on the Commodore trademarks. I don't count these as real Commodore any more than I count this TV as a real RCA. Of course, I do welcome discussion on the matter in the comments. I'm not invested one way or the other, and frankly would love to have a definitive answer. Anyhow, I'm glad I saved this one, even if it does kind of tell a story of woe.
A 486 is always great for vintage PC gaming and nostalgia. And if you're going to have a 486, why not have one with some officially licensed chicken lips? Anyway, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you again soon.